Hi everyone, take a look at modern atomic theory. Now if I'm honest, this is probably my favorite packet because if you're a true chemist, this is where it all kind of starts to make sense. Remember chemists equate reactions we see in the large scale macroscopic world with the microscopic behavior of atoms, yeah. Now the question is, well, what makes atoms tick, right? Well, it turns out it's all about their electronic structure, okay? So what we're gonna do, we're gonna look at the atomic structure of atoms. Now there's kind of the old school way to think about it, which was popular up until about 1926. Then the kind of the world was turned on its head in 1926 with quantum theory, which talked in a different way about how electrons in, in, were arranged in atoms, okay? So a nice way to do it is kind of do it as a progressive kind of historical thing, okay? So we start with old school, we'll see its limitations, then we'll go to the kind of the true accepted model of behavior, which is new school, okay? And we've already talked about this a little bit when we talked about atoms, and I said, hey, you know, our model of the atom is just this kind of like the moon orbiting the earth, yeah? So that's the particle model. And then we talked about the von Oppenheimer approximation and how atoms, you know, the, well, the electrons around atoms are actually really, really small and really fast moving, so they kind of blurred out. We can't really identify where they are. So we kind of sort of say they're in there somewhere, so they're more like a cloud or a wave, okay? So that's kind of how we're gonna do this. We're gonna split it into particle model, which is the first few pages, and then the wave model. Now the particle model, although it works, is what's known as empirical, right? Empirical is a great word, it means, you're right, but you got no clue why. <laughs> awesome word to use in an argument. Okay, so an empirical model works, but there's no kind of physical basis for its effectiveness. It just works and we use it, right? Whereas the wave model is an improvement and we know exactly why it works. Okay, so we'll see how the two are looking at the same problem with different levels of sophistication, okay? And if you like different levels of correctness, but they both work to a point, right? Okay, now, so here's the $64,000 question. We talked about the periodic table a little bit. Periodic table was invented by Mendeleev back in 18 something. And in 1890 something, you know, we didn't have any idea of the electron yet. We didn't have any idea of the nucleus. They're all in the early 1900s, right? So that's, you know, when we talk about, you know, Rutherford and Thompson and Bohr, all those people came around at the turn of the century. So Mendeleev struggling away years before, right? Um, so he didn't know <laughs> how to arrange his first periodic table in terms of numbers of protons. <laughs> Not discovered yet, okay? So he did come up with the first periodic table and it looked very, very similar to this one, right? And the question is, well, I think we mentioned it in our atomic discussion from before, right? About, you know, just simple stuff about atoms. The periodic table is arranged in order of increasing atomic number, reading left to right like a book. So hydrogen has one proton, helium two, lithium three, four, and it reads left to right, like reading a book in terms of increasing atomic number, number of protons. And Mendeleev did exactly the same thing before the proton was discovered. How? Well, he just arranged his periodic table left to right in order of relative weight. So hydrogen's the lightest, helium's the next lightest, so he put lightest to heaviest, and it turns out the number of protons identically matches the number or the weight ma or the mass of an atom. So if you look at the masses and the atomic numbers, they're in the same order, right? Okay, that makes sense, right? Okay. Now, so Mendeleev did his order of weights, and then he did something really, really smart. He got to helium and he pressed return on his ancient typewriter, so lithium starts on row two, like reading the book. Then he got to neon and he pressed return. Argon, press return. So he made rows. These are called periods, right? So why is the periodic table called the periodic table because it has rows, which are called periods, right? Okay, we'll get to why they're called that later. Now, here's the thing, why did he hit return? He hit return, this is the $64,000 answer to the question, right? Because things in the same column were placed there by hitting return just right. So lithium falls under hydrogen because they have similar chemistry. When you hit return in the right spot, things then line up in similar columns I should say, things fall into similar columns with everything having the same kind of chemistry, all right? And that's called a group. So group one are called the alkali metals. They all have similar chemistry. They make alkalis when you dissolve them. Alkali earths, somewhat similar, but these are generally in ores, earths, right? To the other side, 
noble gases, their commonality is no chemistry. They're all in the same family. Okay, these are the halogens, these are called calcogens. So bottom line is Mendeleev put things in the same column because macroscopically, and remember he could only do a macroscopic test tube thing at the time, they have similar chemical and physical properties. They're all metals, right? They're all alkalized when dissolved. These are all gases. They're all inert, they don't do anything. Okay, so you put them in a family group, which we now call a group or a column. Okay, and they go obviously column one, two, and we did this before, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Okay, all right. We now of course know the group one makes a plus one iron, group two makes a plus two iron. That's similar chemistry, okay? So we now know about ions and the relation to the periodic table. All right, the ions themselves make plus one and plus two, et cetera, because of the underlying electronic structure, which we'll get to in a second. All right, so why are things in the same column having the same chemistry? Well, Mendeleev put them there because they have the same chemistry, right? On a microscopic level, why do things have the same chemistry? It's because when atoms bump into each other, they stick, right, to make bonds. Why do they stick? It's because they have electrons on the outside, right? Those are called valence electrons. So those outermost electrons in the atom are the ones that interact with other atoms' outer electrons, right? So it's all about what we call valence electrons, outer electrons. Turns out things in the same column in the periodic table have the same electronic configuration of valence electrons. It's like they're all wearing the same shirt. So things in the same column have the same chemistry because they all have identical electronic arrangements. Okay, and it's those electrons that on the microscopic level do chemistry, all right? So that's the key thing, right? That's the key thing. And to kind of explore that, I'm going to relate the periodic table, which you've just mentioned was arranged based on chemistry, right, by Mendeleev in terms of electronic structure, and then you'll start to see the connection. And this is probably the most powerful piece of theory in general chemistry. Unfortunately, the book does not do it justice at all, so you probably won't see this in the book. It's not me just making this stuff up. This is known by every good chemist, right? We just assume it's true and we don't discuss it at all well or <laughs> it's like our it's like our secret right it's not really a secret okay so remember though outer electrons do chemistry the loss or gain of those outer electrons makes ionic bonds the sharing makes covalent okay now i'm going to show you our big secret right the big secret of chemistry which is the relationship between the periodic table and electronic structure okay now i really suggest you use like a back of a big piece of paper. I'm going to block up, block off my happy smiling face, right? So I won't use a big one, but when you do this, like use the whole piece of paper, make nice big pictures, right? I'm going to try and squeeze my dot diagrams, we call them, which are maps of where electrons are in atoms into this space here. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to emulate the first 12 atoms from the periodic table up to magnesium. Okay, so I'm going to draw kind of just the symbol and the relative position in the periodic table and around those symbols are draw where the electrons live, so to speak. So we have obviously hydrogen, right, under hydrogen is lithium, under lithium is sodium, that's column one, right, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, oh, we're in that space, fluorine, neon, that wasn't so greatly spaced, right? <laughs> then under here, sodium, magnesium, okay. Oh, and of course, helium. Two, eight, 10, 12. There's my first 12 elements, okay? Try and spread yours out over that whole sheet, like we said, okay? If you've got room, do up to calcium, which will be something for an assignment later, okay? All right, so there's our first 12 elements. Now, what I'm going to do is a little bit of uh, origami here. Okay, I'm going to fold this over. Nice. Okay, on the next page, we have seven rules which will determine how we create these configurations. Okay, so seven key facts, right? Okay, so I can even make this even better. Right? 
It's all very hands-on. It's already kindergarten, right? <laughs> so there they are. Right? I'll actually put this up here. We don't need the rest for now. We'll just use the first two. Okay. Key fact number one. Well, how many electrons does each atom have? Well, it's the same as this number of protons, which is the atomic number, right? So whatever the atomic number is, number of protons, all atoms are neutral, same number of electrons. So we just look in the periodic table. The small number in the box is the number of protons, atomic number. That's the same as the number of electrons. So our rule is number of electrons is identical to the number of protons, which is Z, the, the atomic number, number. All right, so for hydrogen, element number one, draw me a little kind of orbit, if you like. That's, you know, that's how we like to think about it, old school, like the satellite orbiting the Earth. One proton, therefore one electron. Then over here, helium, well, it's two, right? Now, here's the thing. There's number one, just like hydrogen, and then one more, right? You're tempted to put it there, aren't you? Because that's common sense. Common sense says, oh, electrons are negative. They kind of push away from each other. That's good logic. Unfortunately, it doesn't really play out in the empirical model. We'll see why we do this in the proper model with the waves. But for now, you're going to put it next door. Okay? You'll see lots of electronic structure diagrams on the internet where it's written here. They are wrong. <laughs> okay. They go next to each other. And we'll see why and understand why as we go. But remember, this, these dot diagrams are initially, initially empirical, meaning we don't really have a clue why it works. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, so rule one, number of dots in my diagram is the same as the number of protons. Okay. Now, if you think about it, lithium has three electrons, right? So why don't I just write lithium, one, two, three, like that. You know, just squeeze another one in there. Ah, well I can't, okay? Because there's no more room. Now the best way to think about this, and I'll uh, kind of go here, okay? Think about Wrigley Field, right? So here's Wrigley Field, there's the diamond, there's the stadium. If you're a VIP, a player, a manager, someone important, right, you can park right next to the stadium in that first ring or layer of parking, right? But there's only room for a few people. Same in atoms. The closer you are to the nucleus or the stadium, the less room there is. In an atom, there's only room for two electrons in that first layer, all right? So it's like all the VIP spots are taken. Well, where do you go from there? Well, you've got to go to the next layer of parking. You've got to pay $30 to park at Dunkin' Donuts or something. I'm talking to you, Cubs fans. All right. Now, of course, I am a Cubs fan by marriage, unfortunately. And, um, and I could never be a Sox fan because I earn over $10,000 a year. That's a joke, but true. <laughs> All right. Back to it. So in the second layer, there's more room. Okay, if I park further away, there's more room. And I go further out still, there's even more room. Okay, so let's go back to the old periodic table here. If we look in the periodic table, there's two elements in the first row. Ah, there's room for two electrons in the first layer. Then lithium isn't here, is it? Mendeleev hit return to put it under hydrogen. Ah. Why? Well, let's look what happens. I start the next layer. Okay, so in lithium, one, two, and then three. So lithium is element number three. Yeah, has three electrons, but the third electron is in the second layer. Hmm, lithium is in the second row. So there's a key fact that relates micro and macro, right? Every time I start a row in the periodic table, I start a new layer of electrons. Fair enough. So lithium's the first member of row two, so it has that first electron in its second layer. There's only room for two electrons in the first layer, so that's why there's only two elements in the first row of the periodic table. I was thinking, hey, why is the periodic table that unique shape, two, eight, eight, in terms of the number of elements in a row? It's because it's the number of electrons allowed in the layer, right? Okay, so let's write that down. So key fact number two, a new shell, we call them, or layer of electrons 
forms for every row in the periodic table. That's a key and awesome fact, right? Key, awesome fact, fair enough. Okay. So, if we look here, what do we see? Two elements in the first row, so there's room for two electrons in the first layer. Makes sense, it's the closest layer, it's the smallest, right? Layers are a fixed distance from the nucleus, right? As we go further out, well, there's more real estate, right? So there's more room for more electrons. Hey, how many electrons do you think I can get in the second layer? Well, there's eight across there, right? So it's eight in the second layer. Ah, so let's write this down. I'm gonna do a bit of origami here, right? Doing lots of origami today. That's fine, right? So if you look at it, in layer one, two electrons, two elements, room for two electrons in the first layer. Layer two, row two, there's eight elements across there. We're gonna fill out the layers in a moment. There'll be eight in the outside by the time we get to neon. Room for eight electrons. So, key fact number three. Each shell is a fixed distance from nucleus. The further out you go, just like Wrigley Field, the more room there is to park, right? Okay. Shell one has room for up to, it can be one or two, right? Up to two electrons. So that's why there's two elements in the first row. I've got one car in the parking lot, two cars in the parking lot, then it's four. Helium's done, right? So helium at the end of the row is maximum occupancy, right? Okay. Shell two has room for up to eight electrons. Neon will have eight around it, and we'll see that in a second, okay? All right, shell three, if you look at the periodic table, well, it's two, eight, eight. Layer three also has room for eight, so that's why the periodic table has that unique shape. Okay, so, fair enough. So now we're at the point where we've got enough information to start writing out some configurations, yeah? If we look at beryllium, element number four, so four electrons, we'll fill that first layer. Now I'm going to recommend you kind of do exactly what I'm doing in terms of how you write these. If you write them in what's called the Aufbau way, Aufbau is German for building up, right? Okay, so I'm building up layers from the bottom. If you think about it, when you park a car, you park as close to the store as possible. If the front row is packed in jewel, you go to the next row, next row. Electrons are attracted to the nucleus, minus is attracted to plus. So the first layer fills first, and then we start to fill the second layer. So as we just did with lithium, well, we'll do the first one, makes sense, put it there, right? Now here's the interesting question, where does the next one go? Now I said this is empirical, right? So it turns out we're going to do this and it's going to work, but there's no real rhyme or reason to it. It works, we don't know why it's, it works though, so we use it, okay? And the rule is, points of a compass. We're going to fill out the points of a compass going this way. North, east, south, west. So one, two, three, four as we go around, right? If you remember this, never eat shredded wheat. That's what I learned, right? So I need one more electron. I did north. Now I'm going to go east. Hmm, okay. Beryllium, two on the outside. Boron, three on the outside. Carbon, four on the outside. Just pause there and fill up the carbon. Okay, back. All right. One, two on the inside. One, two, three on the outside. Boron is element number five. Two and three makes five. Carbon element number six. Two on the inside. One, two, three, four on the outside. Okay, so I went all the way around the points of a compass. Fair enough. Now, the next interesting question. For nitrogen, which is element number seven, all right, so we can have seven electrons, two on the inside, fill that first layer, makes sense, and five more, right? So we do four to make, if you like, carbon. Where's the next one go? Where does the next one go? It actually goes back to north again, and we go around points of a compass again. Okay, so here's my little joke, right? Electrons, and we put it in there. Electrons are a bit like 30-something New Yorkers. They only pair up when they have to. They got careers, right? You've seen the shows on TV. There's at least three shows. Well, this is a theme, <laughs> okay? Yeah, so 
the real reason for this we'll see in the next packet, but bottom line is electrons are negatively charged. They don't like to be next to each other unless they have to be, right? So they don't like to occupy the same region of space unless they have to. These are called orbitals. We'll get onto them in the next packet. But for now, empirical rules, we've gone around the points of our compass and now we're going to pair up. Okay. Ah, so now we can keep going. Go around again. We can do oxygen. One more. Fluorine's going to be a squeeze, but we'll do it. We've got seven on the outside. And finally, neon. Think about it. Neon is the eighth member of the row, so it's going to have eight on the outside. And that completes what we say is called the octet. Okay, because the most interesting elements in nature are in rows two and three. We call that second full layer and that third full layer we'll get to later. The last member has a complete octet, the complete eight electrons. Okay, all right. So let's write some stuff down, okay? So, <clears throat> if I just move this up a bit, all right? Move this up a bit, all right? A little bit of housekeeping. As we mentioned, the valence electrons are the most important. Those are the ones on the outside. So carbon has one, two, three, four electrons, and they're all singles, right? Nitrogen has two, three, four, five electrons on the outside, and two are in a pair, three are singles. So we have the number and arrangement from these dot diagrams, right? So these are called valence. And the ones underneath, that are trapped underneath, they never see the light of day, right? Then unreactive, don't do any chemistry. These are called core electrons. So let's just do that housekeeping, okay? The outer most electrons are valence electrons. And they're in the valence layer. So example, carbon has four valence, boron has three valence, right? The inner shells, let me call those core shells, so this is all kind of interchangeable terms, contain core electrons, unreactive. If you like, let me just paraphrase, so the outermost layer, just one layer is the outer layer, right? It's like the skin of an orange, right? Okay, the outermost layer has the important chemistry electrons, because when an atom bumps into another atom, valence electrons essentially communicate to make bonds, yeah? So the, the outermost layer is the valence layer. It has valence electrons. Anything trapped underneath, now the lower you get in the periodic table, say you're in row six, you're gonna have six layers, right? So the one layer on the outside and five layers trapped, right? It's like an onion, yeah? So those inner layers, anything subsurface, if you like, is a core layer, unreactive core electrons, okay? Now, now we can see something important, right? So we've gone all the way to the end of row one and got helium. We press return because the layer was full. Then we start filling up layer two, right? We get to neon. I'm going to show you there. So we've got the end of row one. Hit return because this is full. Start filling up the second layer. The second layer is now full. So after neon comes sodium, right? So there's no more room in layer two because I've got eight on the outside. Where's the next one going to go, right? Obviously. Obviously, yeah. let's do it. We're going to have one, two, and then eight to make a full two layers, and that's ten electrons, right? Two and eight makes ten. But sodium's number 11, right? The last one goes out there. There it is, okay? So sodium is the first element of row three. Every time I have a new layer, I have a new shell. Right, layer one, layer two, layer three, row one, row two, row three. That's a key fact, right? So every time I have a row, I have a layer. Now the most important fact of today is this, right? Remember things in the same column have similar chemistry. The alkali metals, here they are, right, have similar chemistry. They all also make plus one ions. They're all in group one. Why do they have similar chemistry? Well, look at their outer valence layer. Single electron, single electron, single electron. Things in the same column have identical valence configurations. Therefore, same chemistry. Sure, as you go down the column, they get a little plumper, right? 
But remember, it doesn't matter what's underneath. They're all playing for the same team. They're all wearing the same shirt. They all react the same because they've got the same valence configuration. Now, here's the big trick. What column are these guys in? Column one, right? So they start the row. They're in column one. They start the row on the left, column one. One valence electron. Column two, guess what? Two valence electrons. If we do magnesium real quick, it's going to be sodium with uh, one more electron. Two valence electrons. So column one, one on the outside. Column two, two on the outside. Column three, three on the outside. Column four, four on the outside, all the way up to column eight. Helium's the weird one. Column eight, eight on the outside. Okay, so that's a super, super important fact. The number of valence electrons is the same as the group number. All right, so elements, oh. Elements in the same column have same number valence electrons. Number of column equals number of valence electrons. That's the key thing. If you're in group one, you have one valence electron, you will act the same. You're in column six, you got six valence electrons. You all act the same because you got six valence electrons, okay? And that's the big trick. Okay, well, I'll do some uh, more of these as we go. Okay, we'll do some uh, in this row just to show you that's true. Okay, I've kind of written here, but we'll do some more on the next page of the notes just to show you that's true. All right, now then, the next key fact is a super important one too, and it kind of summarizes what we learned. Okay, did you ever play this game? <laughs> this game is called Battleship. You ever play Battleship? Okay. Battleship's an interesting game because you have this grid and it's alphanumeric, right? So A, B, C, D, E across the top, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 down the side, and then you have a, a point in space, right? So maybe it's B7, right? Okay. And you put these little plastic ships in spots and you try and guess where they are. You say, oh, A6, miss. B7, hit, you hit my battleship, right? Maybe you heard that, okay? And the idea is that you should sink all the person's ships. That's how you're supposed to play battleship. How it works in reality is you wait for your opponent to go to the bathroom and then you kind of peek over the top and see where the ships are. <laughs> okay, so battleship. Now, why am I telling you about battleship? Because there's a definite battleship analogy, okay? The column tells you the number of electrons in the outer layer of an atom and the row tells you the number of layers, right? So if I say to you, oh, carbon, all right? Carbon, column four, row two. That means if I do a blank, I've got two layers with four on the outside, because it's column four, and there must be two trapped underneath, because I know there's two in the first layer. And that, for sure, is carbon's electronic configuration, okay? So the battleship analogy is, the column number equals number of valence electrons. The row number equals number of layers. And you can do all the way up to calcium with that simple battleship analogy. If I picked any of the first 20 elements, this would work, right? So just pick one, right? Oh, what's my favorite? Phosphorus, right? Phosphorus is in column five, row Three. We're going to do phosphorus as an example layer, but it's going to have three layers, five on the outside. We'll see it in a minute. Okay. All right. So that, ladies and gentlemen, in a nutshell, is how the periodic table relates to electronic structure. Remember Battleship, and you'll never get it wrong. Okay. Remember Battleship, and you'll never get it wrong. Okay. I'm about to run out of time. So I'm going to briefly pause. All right, there we go. Briefly pause and come back. See you in a second. Okay, so now I've told you the big secret of the periodic table. Yeah, the periodic table is its unique shape because of the underlying electronic configuration of the atoms. The column tells you the number of electrons on the outside. The row tells you the number of layers. And they arrange 288. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what we've been drawing I'll just run back over here. These are what we call, bit of an error with the camera there. These are what we call dot diagrams, okay? All right, because it has all the dots. 
okay? So we can just look at the periodic table for these elements. We can figure out where they are as long as they appear before calcium. We just use the, you know, the battleship analogy, or we can just count the number of electrons and just do what's called alphabet, which is build up the layers individually, right? I prefer to do alphabet because it helps with the more complex ones, so I'll do that from now on, right? Okay, so if I look at my periodic table, silicon, silicon is in column four, row three, right? And it's got 14 electrons, yeah? Okay, so silicon, 14 electrons. One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I filled the first two layers, right? Okay. Ten electrons. It was element number fourteen, right? So I've got four more to go. One, two, three, four. Battleship, yeah. Three layers, four on the outside. Okay. That's silicon's dot diagram, right? Absolutely brilliant. Now <laughs> <laughs> Once in a couple of generations, someone will come along who will turn the science on its head, right? For organic chemistry, it was someone called G.N. Lewis. He was kind of like the Oscar Wilde or something, or Ernest Hemingway. He's, you know, he's very flamboyant, wears a white suit, smokes a cigar, All right? Kind of a cross between Winston Churchill and KFC guy, <laughs> Colonel Sanders, right? So, um, G.N. Lewis comes along and he says, well, these dot diagrams are great and they work and all good stuff, right? But but they're not really that useful because only the outside electrons are important. And this is what organic chemists take to heart because you know organic chemists use Lewis symbols the whole time. What is a Lewis symbol? Well, it's just the outside electrons. And if you think about it, anything in the same column will have the same Lewis because hey, number of outside electrons is the same as the column number, right? So silicon will have four on the outside. All right, so that's how you might want to do it, but that's not how we do it. For Lewis, we just, just do the dots, right? There we go. So that's the dot diagram, if you like, with the rings, the orbits. Just the outside, four, four. Okay. All right. So finish it up, right? Do uh, chlorine and phosphorus, dots, and Lewis, okay? All right. Come on back, right? So I'll do mine. Chlorine, element number 17. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Two layers full, seven more to go. If I look at chlorine in the periodic table, glance at yours. Hey, look, three layers with seven on the outside. Third layer, number seven across, column seven. All right, chlorine, just seven on the outside. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all right. Phosphorus, so we get to it, here it is. Phosphorus is number 15. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Five more. One, two, three, four, five. Phosphorus, one, two, three, four, five. Five on the outside. Nitrogen is also in column five. Nitrogen has aside from the symbol being different, the same configuration. Column five, five on the outside, okay? Things in the same columns, carbon, fluorine. Things in the same column have identical valence because they're in the same column, same chemistry. So why do things have the same chemistry in the same column? Because they have identical Lewis symbols, essentially, okay? Or identical valence configurations. You now have the power to go all the way up to calcium, okay? So I'm not gonna be able to squeeze mine on, but you can get all your oils up to calcium in here, okay? All right, good practice, try that. All right, now then, keep going, all right? This is gonna come in really, really handy later because later on we're gonna start doing um, what's called a Lewis structure, okay? In, in organic chemistry, a Lewis structure is really a map of where valence electrons are in molecules. It's super powerful theory, right? Okay, but it fundamentally comes from an understanding of Lewis symbols, and Lewis symbols are like the atomic Legos you stick together to make Lewis structures, okay? So what I'm gonna give you now is the formal Lewis symbol. Later on, we'll come back to Lewis symbols, right? And we'll stick them together with some simple rules to make Lewis structures. That's modern atomic theory too, next packet, I believe. Okay, might be a packet or two, it's down the road. All right, so first things first. Now remember what I kind of told you guys earlier, 
try and label your periodic table. All right, I've kind of done mine here. Column one, column two, group two, column three, group three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right? Okay. So we like to talk about columns as groups. Right? Okay, as families, just with the Roman numeral number. All right. So nitrogen is in column five. All right. So is phosphorus. It's right underneath it, and I put them kind of in pairs on purpose, right? Okay. Column five. So column five, five valence electrons. So the Lewis then is going to be the same, five around the center. Now phosphorus, of course, is in the third row, and nitrogen's in the second. So yeah, phosphorus is a little plumper, but they're wearing the same T-shirt, right? They're wearing the phosphorus and nitrogen group five T-shirt, right? Okay, so they have similar chemistry, and that makes absolute sense, because if you think about phosphorus and nitrogen, where do you see those in real life? Well, nitrogen fertilizers, ammonium nitrate, right? Things like that. Ammonia, they're fertilizers, yeah? So we use nitrogen for plants to make them grow. We also use phosphorus for plants to make them grow. If P2O5, for example, is plant food, right? Okay, so, you know, P2O5, NH4, NO3, for example, is a fertilizer. Both of these are fertilizers. Similar chemical and physical properties. Both help plants grow. They're both in the same column. So that's kind of an obvious example, right? Okay. Now, oxygen and sulfur, column six, right? Both of them in column six. So we like to do Roman, <laughs> five, six. Number of valence electrons, column six, six on the outside, right? So easy. And then you've got these in your previous map. I'll just redo them. Remember, only the outside ones for Lewis, right? Okay. So this one actually has an extra layer, right, underneath, right, compared to oxygen. So that's in row two, row three, but they still have the same valence configuration. So they also have the same valence chemistry. Awesome, right? Okay. Now, <clears throat> oxygen and sulfur similar chemistry. We, of course, use, use oxygen, right, to breathe, yeah? So our atmosphere is a nitrogen and oxygen atmosphere. We breathe oxygen, we need it, right? But then there's this theory out there in science fiction. This is like, uh, if you ever watched those terrible Babylon 5 <laughs> show, right? Some of the aliens on the lower decks, they go down there with this breathing apparatus. They're actually breathing sulfur, yeah? And there's a good scientific kind of principle behind that because oxygen and sulfur have similar chemistry. So the theory is, out there in the universe, maybe there's some aliens that breathe sulfur instead of oxygen. It's plausible because similar chemistry, right? Okay. Now here's a crazy thing. You're going to going to kind of maybe report me to the authorities and say I'm gone crazy, but no, I'm going to tell you something, right? I'm going to tell you there's aliens on this planet. Don't call 911 yet. <laughs> there are aliens on this planet, right? And I can prove it. Okay. There are sulfur breathing aliens on this planet, and I can prove it. Now you're getting worried, right? <laughs> now, here's the thing. You can look it up on the internet, right? Down at the bottom of the ocean, there's what's called the Mid-Atlantic Rift, right? So the African plate and the American plate are drifting apart very slowly, yeah? And it's ripping a, a hole in the bottom of the ocean, right? And then occasionally volcanoes will spew out of this hole. That's what Iceland is, right? Okay, so Iceland sits right on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and it's just like a, an eruption of... A volca underground volcano that got to the surface, right? But sometimes the volcano doesn't come out, okay? It just rips apart, yeah? But gases do escape. So down at the bottom of the ocean, right? And it's miles deep, yeah? There's no light, there's no heat from the sun, right? And there's very little oxygen. So nothing lives there. It's called the abysmal plain. There's no life. It's a bit like Cold City. It's <laughs> a joke, <laughs> right? Okay. And you know, you could go down in the submarine, and you could skim across the bottom, there's just no life. Nothing down there. It's too deep, too cold nothing, right? And then you come across the fissure, right? The Mid-Atlantic Rift, right? And you'll find a volcanic vent, yeah? And what's the volcanic vent doing? Well, it's creating heat, right? And it's also creating gas, sulfurous gas, yeah? So there's a spot of warmth and a spot of sulfur there, right? And guess what? The aliens I speak of, they're actually bacteria. So they're a bacteria that have evolved separately from every other life form on this planet that breathes oxygen to breathe sulfur, and they live on the volcanic vents, okay? And guess what, as uh, was it quite gone said, you know, there's always a bigger fish, right? 
<laughs> so if something eats the bacteria, something eats the something that eats the bacteria, and these kind of rings of life have evolved around these volcanic vents, right? It's like anemones and crabs and shrimps and all these kind of things that eventually have made an independent food web, all right? So, extra credit. Show me a picture of a, of a volcanic vent with all the life around it for one point of extra credit. I'll make this due very generously on Sunday, right? So Sunday of this week. You've got a test coming up, so I'm going to let the lab and the lecture run through till Sunday, okay? Whatever date that is, right? So I'm not even going to try, <laughs> okay? All right. So, sulfur breathing aliens, fantastic. All right. Last two, last pair, are carbon and silicon, right? Column four. Okay, four valence electrons, carbon, silicon. All right, so <clears throat> carbon and silicon both have four valence electrons. Carbon, of course, is what organic life is made from. If you ever watch Star Trek, we are the, the carbon units, right? That's Star Trek 1, right? <laughs> <laughs> because our chemistry is based on organic chemistry, which is the chemistry of carbon, essentially. So we are the carbon units, right? Our, our life depends on the chemistry of carbon. And then, you know, the science fiction writers get hold of that and they think, well, carbon and silicon have similar chemistry, right? Yeah, okay, right. Why well, can't I have a silicon-based life form? And again, popular theory in sci-fi, right? I can't show you evidence of silicon-based life, although, you know, <laughs> I think the writer of Terminator would disagree, <laughs> but... Uh, there is a halter, right? So if you watch the original Star Trek, this is a living rock, right? It's kind of cool, it's a living rock. Okay, so this has been like the theory for like several Star Trek episodes, just new generation old and, you know, original series. So it's a living rock. Really good episode that if you ever get to see it. All right. So bottom line is this. Key fact, the number of valence electrons is the same as the column number. It doesn't matter how far down an atom is, it's just got more full layers underneath, right? So the outer layer is the same. As long as you remember that, you understand Lewis symbols. All right, now, why is this important? Okay. So, last page before we get to uh, the new stuff, okay? And I'll do that in part two, right? Okay. So why is all this important? So if you read the book, they talk about the octet rule almost obsessively, right? I don't call it the octet rule for good reason because it's really a full valence layer rule, right? And if you think about it, only rows two and three need eight on the outside to be complete. Hydrogen does some interesting chemistry, but it doesn't have eight on the outside. That's what an octet is, right? So I call it the full valence shell rule, all right? Now, the bottom line is this, and there's much more detail later, okay? But here's a key fact. If we look in the old periodic table, the noble gases, right? So helium, neon, argon, that last column those elements or those atoms do not react. They're all in the same family, right? You know, on some periodic tables, they kind of have them marked off as a special kind of red line there, and these are special, right? Well, they are. Why are they special? They're at the end of the row. They've got a full layer, right? So everything at the end of a row has a full layer. Fantastic. The chemistry of a full layer is the chemistry of nothing. They don't react. Interesting. So it turns out they're stable, right? So it turns out atoms with full outer layers are stable. They don't need to react with anything to become more stable. So they just exist as atoms in nature. So it's helium atoms, neon atoms, argon atoms, etc. Right? Anything in the last column, separate individual atoms. And we talked about that very briefly when we talked about gases. Sorry, when we talked about mixtures, right? I showed you the definition of elements and compounds and we said, oh, noble gases are atomic elements, right? They're just atoms, yeah. Now, here's the thing. Every atom in nature wants to be stable. And if it is stable, it will have a full outer layer. And that's why bonding happens. So if you think about it, an ionic bond is stealing an electron, giving away an electron. Why do they do that? Because if I steal maybe one electron, maybe I get a full layer. If I do that, I'm stable. Hey, maybe if I just give one away, I get a stable layer left behind. Yeah, that's what happens. Well, maybe if I share, I'll get a full layer, right? That's what happens, okay? So whenever we write a chemical equation, what's happening under the hood is the completion of outside layers by some way, right? Either stealing, giving away, or sharing, 
Okay, so let's take a peek. Again, more on this later, but this is fundamentally why all chemical reactions occur. Let's make some lithium fluoride, right? You know how this works. Li plus F minus, right? Why does the electron jump over to fluorine? Well, because it's electronegative. Why is it electronegative? Ah, okay, so here's lithium, right? Lithium has one, two, three electrons. We know it's dots, right? Dot structure, dot diagram. Fluorine, I'll draw it with crosses just so we know who's who, right? There, okay, now if you think about it, when these bump together, the atoms, electrons will swap around, right? So both atoms have full outer layers, yeah? What's the easiest way to do that? Well, lithium can gain seven or lose one. Fluorine can lose seven or gain one. I'll put like a space there, right? This electron's just gonna jump over here, yeah? Because of electronegativity, fluorine will be stronger and it will steal lithium's electron, right? But why fluorine, it's interesting. Fluorine is the strongest electron stealer in nature, but it only ever steals one electron, not two like oxygen, not three like nitride, right? Just one. Why do you still only one if you're the strongest? because it only needs one to get a full outer layer. And then what do we get? Well, we get lithium. It's still a plus three nucleus, and now with two electrons, right? Put a box around it. That's a plus one ion. That's lithium plus, right? Okay. But what does this electronic structure look like? It's just got one full layer. It looks like helium, and that's key. We say it's isoelectronic. It has the same electronic arrangement as helium. Okay, so every atom in nature, when bonded, looks like a noble gas. Key fact, right? Okay, what about fluorine? Well, it had the two on the inside, and then the seven on the outside, and then it gained one, right? So it became minus, that's F minus. Which noble gas is isoelectronic with fluoride, F minus? It's got two full, out, two full layers, right? Oh, that is neon. It looks just like neon. So every ion looks like a noble gas because it's either lost or gained electrons to have a full outer layer. That's why ionic bonds form, okay? That's why fluoride only makes a minus one, right? Because it only needs one electron. Oxygen makes a minus two, right? Guess what? It's got two holes, it needs two electrons. Nitride's got three holes, okay. Why does calcium make a plus two? Because it loses two electrons, it's column two. Metals will lose, non-metals will gain. Okay, All right, try MGO then. Try MGO, all right, pause and come back. Here's MG. All right. MG, let me just get it, it's column three, all right. Sorry, column two, row three. There you go. Column two, row three. Plus oxygen. Do crosses again. If you like two gaps, all right? Oxygen's gonna be the winner. All right. Oh look, two electrons need to go. What am I left with? Mg with two full layers. Mg plus two, right? Oxygen became oxide. Two full layers. Fuck. There we go. So Mg two plus. O2 minus. Okay. What are these isoelectronic with? What's got two full layers? Neon. Two full layers. Neon. Okay. So that's why magnesium goes two plus. It loses. Two electrons, it's in column two. Column two makes plus two, now you know why. Oxygen makes O2 minus, why? It gains two electrons, because it's got two spots that need to be filled. It's got six on the outside, needs eight. <sighs> got it, okay. So that's covalent bonding in a nutshell, all right? What's the other kind of bonding? The other kind of bonding is, of course, covalent, okay? And the perfect covalent bond is between two atoms of identical strength, electronegativity. So let's look at F2. So I've got fluorine, and I'll draw it in a certain way. Atoms can twist and turn in space, so it's kind of okay to flip the direction, that's fine. All right, so there's fluorine, all right? Column seven, row two. Here's another fluorine, and I'll draw it conventionally. All 
All right, pardon the interruption there, okay? So, think about it. If I coalesce these two atoms, right, bump them together, what's going to happen? This electron's going to go into that hole. This electron's going to go into that hole. Ah, they're going to overlap. Aha! Now, covalent bonding, as we said, was the sharing of electrons, right? If we look, no one lost, no one gained, they're shared, right? And this region of space here, this is like a Venn diagram, this will be the overlap, right? That is a region of space owned by both atoms. So what does that mean? That has eight on the outside when it's sharing. That one has eight on the outside when it's sharing. They both look like neon, okay? So you can steal electrons, give away electrons, or share electrons to get a full outer layer. People call that an octet. That's only true for rows two and three. Hydrogen, hmm, well, let me ask you, how many electrons does hydrogen need on its outside to be a full layer? Two, right? So hydrogen gas is actually that. <laughs> okay, two and two, right? Okay. Now, later on, when we do Lewis structures, a shared pair will be a stick. So every time you've seen a stick, it's actually this, right? We don't draw this every time. Too much work. We draw this, okay? So when I did, for example, oxygen, it has a double bond. We just have two shared pairs. That's a double bond. More on that later. Okay, maybe you've done that before in high school. All right, stop there. I'll come back with part two, which will be kind of the truth, right? So in 1926, things turned around and we started to think about the true nature of matter, okay? But that's going to be in part two, so I'll see you then.